messaging now about the US and Adams has got a chance here and scores! Tyler Adams! US 1-0! He's played by Tobin Heath and that's another goal! Harley Lloyd! It's the dawning of a new era. U.S. over Costa Rica. Here's Crystal. Playing it in. The header. And the goal. Tom and Long range shot from Fakir. Stefan had to make an important save. Dembele. Gotta be kidding me. Inviting ball in. And there's the first one. What cross in for Tim Weah. The U.S. starting to have some fun here in Philadelphia. It's the last kick. The U.S. is going to France. On that note, good morning, everyone, and welcome to Scottsdale. Welcome to our annual general meeting. As president of U.S. Soccer, I hereby call our National Council meeting to order. It's wonderful to see you all, so many friends, colleagues, and partners. We come from every corner of our country, from every kind of community, but we're all here for the same reason. We all love this game, and we all want to make soccer in America, the very best it can be. So on behalf of all of us at U.S. Soccer, let me express our appreciation, firstly, to everyone here at the McCormick Ranch Resort for their hospitality. And thank you as well to all our local members, our youth, the Arizona Soccer Association, and our adults, the Arizona State Soccer Association. It was great to see so many of you. We have sunshine today. <laughs> it was great to see so many of you uh, at your council meetings yesterday, and I hope you all had a good time at last night's welcome event, but not too good a time, I hope. We have a full schedule today, including tonight's dinner, when we'll present our highest honor, the Werner Fricker Builder Award, to the one, the only, April Heinrichs. We have a, a lot on our agenda this morning, so I want to get right to it. Here at U.S. Soccer, we're not just a federation, we're a family. And when, our, when a member of our family succeeds, we're united in our pride for them. And when we lose a member of our family, we're united in our grief. Could I ask you please to stand for a moment of silence as we remember and honor the friends and members of our soccer family who left us this past year. Thank you, everyone. If you could please take your seats. The friends we lost this year that's knew that soccer truly brings us together as communities, as a country, a country that has defend, been defended by patriots. And this includes military, military veterans on our U.S. Paralympic team, such as Gavin Sibayan. Growing up in Colorado, Gavin loved sports including soccer. He enlisted in the U.S. Army, attained the rank of Staff Sergeant, and deployed to Iraq. During a one-month period, his convoy was hit by explosive devices on three separate occasions. He is the recipient of two Purple Hearts. Later, returning home, he suffered two strokes and lost feeling on his right side. But he said, I couldn't let anything hold me back. He started competing with our Paralympic soccer team, represented the United States at two Paralympics, and here at the Federation, Gavin serves on the Athlete Council. Gavin has worn the uniform and fought for our nation. He has worn the crest and played for our nation. And we're deeply honored this morning that Gavin is with us today. I'm gonna to ask you please to join me in welcoming and thanking Gavin and stand as he leads us in the Pledge of Allegiance.
I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you, Gavin, for your service to our nation. And at this point, can I invite Bob Kepner, chair of our Credentials Committee, to come up, conduct the roll call, provide the Credentials Committee report for today's meeting. Bob? I took my little detour because I wanted to say hello to Cindy Parlo Cohn, who is originally from Tennessee, but now she is North Carolinian, and she's a favorite daughter of ours. So she is outstanding, and I just wanted to say hello. So welcome to Arizona, Cindy. It gives me enormous pleasure. Boy, this is a hard to place, see place in here, isn't it, Carlos? <laughs> uh, it's always a pleasure to stand before you and to welcome you and also to explain how this all goes about. Those of us who've been around for a long time, remember before we had these little keypads and so on, we had cards and everything, lots of the folks in this room remember that. For a number of years, we've had a special way of balancing the boats. Carlos emphasized that we're a family, and that's the essential element of our system for voting. We want every member of the United States Soccer Federation family to be a legitimate whole part of that family. And that's the basis for the voting system that we have. So we'll go ahead and explain it and I'll start out with a statement that we know that we have four different councils, the youth, the adult, the pro, and the athletes. The three first ones, the youth, the adult, and the pro, they are equally weighted. This is not new information to you, but I always do remember that sometimes we have some brand new people to our gathering here, so I like to explain the little details of how we do it. We go on the basis of using the largest of those three groups, that's the youth. In this case, you'll find out that there are 301 votes that's not necessarily the number of people, but the 301 votes. And then, using magical mathematics, we equate the adult council vote to equal that, and the pro council vote to equal that. And then we add some uh, the other persons, the other members. And together, we add all of those together and then balance out so that the athletes vote is effectively tw at least 20% of the total vote. So I'll give you the, the details. The, I believe you showed the first slide that that was the youth council already, and I presume the adult council was shown. Let me just run through them. I was looking out and with the lights, it's a little difficult. Okay, the youth council, you can see 301 votes. We've listed all of the state associations. Um, affiliate organizations and the commissioners, total of 301. So mathematically, the three councils, youth, adult, and pro must equal that. So we'll move on to the adult. Same effective system here. And we take 193, and we're gonna have to use some magical mathematics to make 193 equal to 301, and we'll do that in a moment. So we'll move on to the pros. And I want to say that I'm very pleased with the attendance of the pros this time. This is the largest number of delegates that we've ever had. And so I want to applaud them. Personally, I'll applaud them. <laughs> being a part of the family and being part of the process is absolutely critical. We'll move on to the others, the next slide. 
and you see that we have the Athletes Council, 11 here, and uh, that's close to the number that we had last year. That was the, uh, the record that we'd had. That's very important. We'll move on to the next slide. And the other affiliates, and you can see national associations and such, other members total, 14, well represented. We'll move on. And then we have the life members, a critical part of our, our, our membership. Uh, these are folks who have done all of the things through the years to keep us, get us started and keep us going, so we appreciate their continuing to attend. Next slide. The board of directors and the past presidents. This, of course, is the first time we've had three persons listed in that past presidents category. So Bob, Conagulia, Dr. Bob, Alan, and Sunil now is the newest person. Sunil also does sit on the board of directors, but you see each person can only have one uh, vote for one entity. And so Sunil, although sitting on the board of directors, also votes, only votes as a past president. Okay, next slide. And then I talked about the fact that we have a multiplier situation. So you can see on the far left, the, all of those numbers, so it added up, those added up to 558. And then we have to equate the adult council and the pro council to equal the youth council. And then the athletes count, we add the 301 times three is 903 plus 36 is 939. And then 20% of the total mathematically of the 1181 is 242. So this is our system, the multipliers. And these are already in your individual keypads. And we spent time last night, night putting them out there on the tables at your spots. So the youth council, obviously one. Adult council, you can see, I won't go through them individually. But each time we vote, this is the way it works. So thank you for that. I do want to say a couple of things here. Uh, Practice is very important in life. Uh, we do that in soccer all the time, I know. And um, you have keypads in front of you that look very complicated. If I could borrow yours, yes, it's, it's a horribly complicated item, but it has power. So I'd like you to pick it up and we're gonna practice the use of this complicated device. And we have a special question that we want to ask you and if we'll go ahead and display that question. Um, now, first I'll explain, voting is live when the question appears on the screen. For bylaws, you'll select one for yes and two for no. You can change your vote until the voting stops. And the way that we do it is I'll signal it by saying vote now uh, st or stop voting now. And it counts down five, four, three, two, one. And when it stops at that point, you've all, you had to have voted already. So you can see it's a uh, it's a very important thing. Let's go to the next slide. So here's your practice question. Have you ever attended a FIFA Women's World Cup? Push one for yes and two for no. Okay, vote now. Five, four, three, two, one. Let's see what the results are. And that's excellent. 43.2% say yes, and 56.8% say no. Now, as I looked around the room, though, I, as you were doing that, I, I saw some nervousness about how to use these devices. Uh, and, and let me tell you a story. Last night, I mean, you know, the Credentials Committee uh, spends hours getting ready for these events. And, practically spend the whole night. And I was out in the desert last night after we finished up in here. And lo and behold, unbelievably, two animals walked up to me. I said, what are you doing? Well, I happen to be the state mammal. And you can see the cat on the side. There, number one, is the uh, ring-tailed cat. That's the state mammal of Arizona. The friendly little fellow on the right, number two, is a ridge-nosed rattlesnake. And those two fellows uh, slithered and walked up to me 
And I said, what are you doing? Well, we're out here playing soccer. And I said, okay, are you any good at it? Oh, absolutely, very good. And uh, the, uh, the cat said, when it comes to a soccer ball, I'm the best around. So they, uh, he certainly knew the, the shape of the ball. And the, um, the snake, the uh, rattlesnake said, I'm the hist, I'm the best there is. So I'm going to ask you now to vote to see who, which of the two would win a penalty kick shootout, the ring-tailed cat or the ridge-nosed rattlesnake. Push one for the cat and two for the rattlesnake. Okay, five, four, three, two, one. And let's see the result. Oh my gosh, the cat did it. Well, you know what the snake said? I tried my best to rattle you, but it just didn't work. The cat responded, I'm feline fine. <laughs> Thank you very much to the members of the staff who have gotten all of this together. Uh, Caitlin Carducci, Greg Fike, Lydia Walke, Pink Arena, and Liz Frazier, and the members of the committee, Siri Molinix, Kathy Zolod, Demetria Sefstatu, and Tony Falcone, who have done a superlative job in getting this all done. I will now ask for a motion to accept the credentials report. I hear a motion, I hear a second. All those in favor, please say aye. Opposed, please say no. Motion carries. Thank you very much. Have a nice meeting. Okay, on that note, thank you, Bob. Thank you to the entire Credentials Committee for your great work. <clears throat> Let's move on. Everyone should have received the transcript of our meeting last year in Orlando. And the, the, meetings, the transcript was approved by the board as draft minutes and has been published on the U.S. Soccer website. If there are no further corrections, the minutes will stand as approved. All right, thank you. Moving on. Today, we can all take pride that soccer in America is more popular than ever, with more players, more coaches, more referees, more fans than ever before. And for this, we can thank countless leaders who have devoted so much of their lives to this sport and to our federation, especially our distinguished life members. We're honored to be joined by some of them today. And if I can Name them out, Gianfranco Baroni, Dr. Bob Contiguglia, Mike Edwards, Bert Hames, Gerhard Mengel, Francisco Marcos, and Hank Steinbrecher. Welcome. Please stand up. Thank you. Thank you. I'd also like to acknowledge and thank our past presidents. Not, I don't think Alan's here today. I haven't seen him this morning. But of course, Dr. Bob and Sunil Gulati to my right. <laughs> We're also very, very pleased to be joined by a number of special guests. And please join me in welcoming, and I'd ask you to stand as I call you, the president of Canada Soccer, a great partner, friend of ours in our United 2026 bid, bring back the cup to North America, Steve Reed. <laughs> From UEFA over in Switzerland, head of national teams competitions, Lance Kelly. <laughs> and from FIFA, the regional development manager of the Americas, Jose Rodriguez, and Director of Member Associations of the Americas, Jair Bertoni. And if I might add, Jose and Jair, we thank FIFA for its continuing support of all its member associations, including our own, particularly with programs like FIFA Forward. We're very, very grateful to you. Thank you. And another critical player in our 2026 bid. In fact, he was instrumental 
in winning support, strong support, unanimous support from CONCACAF for our bid. We could not have won without them. CONCACAF President Victor Montagliani. I'm delighted that Victor will share a few, words, a few words with us later this morning. On that note, let me turn to the President's report. A year ago, you gave me the incredible honor of serving as President. And once again, from the bottom of my heart, I thank you for this great, enormous privilege. It's been deeply humbling, and I'm grateful to so many of you. We are, after all, a Federation. We're only as strong as our members and our ability to work together as one united team. So to all of you who have offered your, uh, your talents and your time, I can't thank you enough. When I spoke to you last year, we all agreed that U.S. soccer needed to change. And I promised to focus on four main priorities, to make soccer in America the very best it can be. Look, we still have a lot more to do, but the tw past 12 months I believe has been a year of progress and change in these four areas. First, we had to win our bid to co-host the Men's World Cup in 2026. Our joint bid with Canada and Mexico was the first ever three-country bid, so we came together and worked together as equal partners in friendship and in mutual respect. It was also the first time that all member associations of FIFA had a vote in that decision. The question of who would host in 26 often, often became mixed with global politics. There were moments when some thought we might not win. So we put together a plan that highlighted not only our world-class stadiums and cities, but also our values, our diversity, and how our countries welcome people from all over the world. We waged a global campaign. We worked hard for every vote. And it paid off. We won by an overwhelming margin. And for the first time ever, oh, sorry, first time in more than 30 years, the Men's World Cup will come back to America. As I've said before, and I'll say it again, this will be an extraordinary opportunity to energize soccer in America. And not just in 26 but in the years leading up to it. Second priority, we agreed last year that our governance had to be more open, more accountable, more inclusive, with more oversight. And so it's been a year of reform. I made a point to communicate with all of you regularly so that you know what's happening at the Federation and why. We created two new committees, a technical development committee and a commercial committee so that the board now plays a greater role in all Federation activities. All six of our board committees are now under new leadership. Meanwhile, at Soccer House, we restructured our senior management to align with the board and improve that accountability. In fact, I'm pleased that we've now named <clears throat> nine of our 10 senior managers who report to the CEO and, and we're moving ahead with our search for the first ever general manager for our women's national team. We formalized and expanded our membership department so that we're listening to and serving all our members better. All 12 standing committees, task forces, and panels have more new members than ever before, new voices and new perspectives from across the Federation. We strengthened our commitment to diversity, equality, and inclusion, including appointing our first ever chief talent and inclusion officer Tonya Wallach. And today, we'll elect a new independent director and a new vice president to help us sustain and build on these reforms. So as we move forward, I hope we can also deal honestly with an issue that has come up over the years, time after time again. The fees, the fees that you, the members, including youth and adults, pay to the Federation. When you raise these concerns, we take them seriously. So we open the books. We dug into the numbers, because it's important that we all know and have the facts. And what we found is that over the years, the Federation consistently gives back to our collective membership more than what it pays us in fees. This, is, this includes, for example, grants to members from our Innovate to Growth Fund. 
However, this doesn't include the many non-cash contributions and support that members receive from the Federation. More importantly, going forward, and that's where I hope we can focus our overall relationship and how we work together <coughs> to strengthen it. And that's more important to me than who pays what to whom. Of course, growing the game requires something else, growing our budget. And as you'll hear today, we propose to draw on our surplus so that we can increase our spending budget for this new fiscal year by 18% to more than $136 million. This will be our largest increase in several years and our largest budget ever, allowing us to increase our investments across the board. But that said, to truly compete with world-class programs like Germany, England, France, Spain, and others in Europe, we, which have budgets that are much, much larger than ours, we still need to do dramatically better. I'm pleased that with the new major multi-year sponsorships, we are on our way, but we have a long way to go. I want to share one further thought on the relationship between the Federation and its members. As you know, the Federation has unfortunately been subjected to lawsuits from within our soccer family. Defending each suit consumes significant time, energy, resources, and obviously including legal fees. And I want to take this opportunity to say to everyone, you have my commitment as president, the commitment of this board to being your partner. And it is my sincere hope that instead of rushing to the courts when there's a disagreement, we can work together through our differences amicably. Instead of paying huge, massive legal fees to, law to lawyers, let's invest that money where it really belongs, in our players, coaches, referees, helping our teams achieve their highest potential. This relates to my third priority, truly investing in our national teams. We're making sure that from now on, soccer operations are run by soccer experts. On the men's side, I know that change hasn't come always as quickly as some would have wanted to. But between doing it fast and doing it right, we've, de we've been determined to do this right, and we are. And we're thrilled, thrilled to have hired our first ever general manager for the men's, three-time World Cup veteran, Ernie Stewart. Ernie. Ernie led our search for a new head coach, the first U.S. World Cup veteran to become head coach of the team, Greg Berhalter, who's here with us this morning. <laughs> Greg, I warn you, we're all soccer experts in this room. You're going to get a lot of free advice this morning. Um, <clears throat> Benny, we're delighted that both of you could join us this morning. But with a rising, a rising crop of young, talented players, the new culture, Greg, that you're introducing into the squad, we believe our men are poised for a new era. And what does that mean? Most importantly, defending this year their title at the CONCACAF Gold Cup. Best of luck. And what an amazing year it was for our women's national team. A historic 500th win, an undefeated 2018 winning the She Believes Cup and the Tournament of Nations and their sixth CONCACAF championship. Congratulations to Jill Ellis and our extraordinary women, the number one women's team in the world. <laughs> Jill couldn't be with us this morning. Uh, they're in Tampa, they're just beginning camp, but as they're starting camp and as they prepare for the next She Believes Cup, I want to encourage everyone here to get out, support our women as they get ready to defend their title at this year's World Cup in France and bring that trophy home again. But we can't rest on our laurels. We have to consistently review our programs and push ourselves to get better. The truth is, our U20, our U17 women had another difficult year. Looking ahead, the competition on the women's side is only going to get more intense. Around the world, more nations are investing heavily in women's soccer. In fact, at the UEFA Congress last week, which I was at, they announced a four-year strategic plan to take women's football to a new level. Now, all of that means 
that we have to do even more to sustain the competitive edge of our women's programs here in the United States. And that is why today I'm announcing a new strategic review of women's soccer. We're going to pull together a team of experts from inside and outside the Federation, and I'm going to propose that it be led jointly by our next Vice President, as well as our future General Manager of the Women's National Team. We're going to review all levels, from the youngest grassroots programs to the senior women's team. And we're going to undertake a complete inventory of what we're doing today, with the goal of determining what more we could be doing and where we can be investing more tomorrow because we need to ensure excellence across all our women's teams. So when we look ahead to 2027, we can imagine, dare I say dream, of once again hosting the Women's World Cup right here in the United States, including a win on home soil. <laughs> Beyond our national teams, we honor every athlete who wears the crest. This year, we'll be cheering our Paralympians in the World Championship in Spain and the Parapan American Games in Peru. And the best of luck, too, to our beach national team as they aim to qualify for the Beach Soccer World Cup. I'm pleased to announce that starting this year, for the first time ever, we will have a new department at U.S. Soccer focused exclusively on supporting our extended national teams the Paralympians, beach, and futsal, with a dedicated budget starting this year at $2 million. Strong teams also depend, of course, on a strong and passionate fan base. Today, we're once again joined by members of our fan council, who I would ask to stand and be recognized. I'm not, sorry, I'm not sure where you are. There we are. Thank you for your commitment, and we're delighted, of course, that so many fans, including younger fans today, come out to support, especially our women. And we're always committed to improving that fan experience. We'll soon be releasing a brand new website and an app for fans later this year. And we're working with the council um, in, in conjunction with the council. World-class games also depend on world-class referees. Our American referees are some of the most respected in the world. In fact, there were four American referees selected for the Men's World Cup in Russia, more than any other country. On VAR, the United States, including Major League Soccer, or I should say because of Major League Soccer, is also a global leader. At a FIFA summit last month in Morocco, we made the case that VAR should be part of this year's Women's World Cup, like it was in Russia for the men. And I'm pleased to say it's under serious discussion and we all hope that FIFA makes the right decision at their meeting next month, because our women deserve the very best technology, just like our men. And as we see around the world, strong federations also depend, require strong domestic professional leagues. So we celebrate the success of all our professional leagues, from the NWSL heading into their seventh season, to the USL, including the new USL Championship, to the thriving Major League Soccer on track for 28 teams. And if anyone doubts the strength and future of soccer in America, they need only look at the most recent MLS Cup. It was the largest crowd ever. The future is indeed soccer. Congratulations, Don. So how do we build up this energy, or on this energy, and excitement in the years ahead? And this brings me to my fourth, or our fourth and final priority, growing the grassroots. For the second year in a row, the Federation offered up to $3 million from our Innovate to Growth Fund to help our youth and adult members boost participation. And as I hope you all saw, we recently announced this year's recipients, and we congratulate all of them. But I do want to point out, and I'd be remiss if I didn't, that of 103 eligible members, only 20 applied for funds. And so of the $3 million we had available, only 1.2 million was granted. 
and that's nearly two million left on the table. This is money we've set aside for you, and we want you to have it. But members have to apply, and I want to once again encourage every eligible member to come to us with your ideas, actionable plans, programs that will help grow the game. Growing the game, might I add, also includes attracting more adults and players for life. I informed the Adult Council yesterday that we agreed with our friends at UEFA to inaugurate a new Amateur Cup between the champions of our USASA Amateur Cup and the UEFA Regions Cup. The photo you're looking at is from this year's champions, the Milwaukee Bavarians. We're aiming to start this new cup in 2020, and we hope it becomes, in time, an annual event so that our amateur players have even more competitive opportunities ahead. Because increased programming, I believe, will translate to increased membership. At the same time, we need to address the challenges facing youth soccer. We all know that the youth soccer landscape is way too fragmented. We need multiple pathways for player development. Too many kids, especially from underserved and immigrant communities, cannot afford to play the game they love which is heartbreaking. And I'll say it again and again, fixing youth soccer must be our highest priority. And that is why, for the first time ever, we have brought all our youth organiza organizations together in a single task force to address the many challenges facing youth soccer. I'd like to thank all the leaders of all these youth organizations who have stepped up, as well as all the experts and thought leaders from a wide range of backgrounds who are volunteering on the working groups, and who Dr. Pete Zofi announced at yesterday's Youth Council. They're tackling issues across the board, membership growth, diversity and inclusion, coaching, refereeing, risk management, and safe sport, and standards and certification. And we're just beginning to see those results. But with the Federation and all our youth organizations finally all sitting around the same table, aligned around the same common goals, this could be our best opportunity yet to put soccer in America on a new course. In closing, we acknowledge that as a federation and as a soccer nation, we still have a long way to go. But after a difficult chapter, we've turned the page and we're focused on the future. Winning the bid for 26, making governance more open and accountable, truly investing in our national teams and growing the grassroots, we are on our way. But I want to leave you <coughs> with a story that captures <coughs> why I'm so very optimistic. In November, I went down to Bradenton to visit with our U20 men. Coach Tab Ramos and the team were in the final stages of the CONCACAF U20 championship. I watched a training session, and afterwards we spent some time together. They're some of the most impressive young men you'll ever meet. And just look at what they accomplished. Eight victories in eight games at the CONCACAF tournament. In the final match, defeating Mexico 2-0, winning their second straight CONCACAF championship, and qualifying for this year's U-20 World Cup in Poland. Just as impressive as what they've done is how they've done it, truly as a team. During that tournament, the CONCACAF tournament, 11 different players scored, with assists by 15 different players. When I met with them, I was also struck by their incredible diversity, young men from so many different backgrounds coming together on the field as one united team. When midfielder Alex Mendez was named the 2018 player, the Young Player of the Year, he spoke with humility about his family, that's Alex, his teammates, and his squad, and he said, None of this will be possible without them. And when Alex signed his first professional contract this fall at just 18 years old, he said, it's only the beginning. I'm sure all of you have your own stories about the hope and optimism that inspires and drives us forward. Serving and growing this game we all love so dearly. So to all of you here today, thank you for your partnership. Thank you for the progress we've made, this, made together None of this would be possible without you. U.S. soccer is changing, but it's only the beginning. Thank you all very much. Thank you. From the grassroots to our national teams, 
We are united, we're determined, we're focused on the future and what we can build and achieve together. Well, we meet in an hour of change and challenge, in a decade of hope and fear. No man can fully grasp how far and how fast we have come. So it is not surprising that some would have us stay where we are a little longer, rest, await. This country of the United States was not built by those who waited and rested and wished to look behind them. And no nation which expects to be the leader of other nations can expect to stay behind. But we do not intend to stay behind and in this decade we shall make up and move ahead. And they may well ask, why climb the highest mountain? Why fly the Atlantic? Because that goal will serve to organize and measure the best of our energies and skills. Because that challenge is one that we're willing to accept, one we are unwilling to postpone, and one we intend to win. We choose to go to the moon in this decade and do the other thing, not because they are easy, but because they are hard. We call that the moonshot video, and I, I could watch that all day. <laughs> but I, I, look, I really believe it captures our spirit and hopes for the future. So as we look forward, and we give thanks to everyone across our Federation who has worked to bring us to where we are today, and foremost among them is our CEO and Secretary General Flip, Dan Flynn. Please join me in welcome, welcoming Dan for the CEO's report. Thanks, Carlos, and again, welcome to Scottsdale, everyone. While 2018 was an interesting year in many ways, it was time to reset our plans and position our organization for the future. To that end, we restructured our organization to better address the demands of our business and refined our focus to better deliver services to our member organizations. Simply put, we are committed across the organization to making soccer the preeminent sport by supporting our members, impacting athletes, and serving our fans. As we look to 2019, we are eagerly anticipating the Women's World Cup when our team will strive for their fourth star. Jill has said many times, we are not defending our title. Rather, we are trying to win another one. For preparation, the team has an incredible slate of matches in front of them before traveling to France, starting with the She Belize Cup at the end of the month. The She Belize platform has grown to include the She Belize Summit, a gathering of top female leaders who provide ideas and case studies on how our sport can continue to inspire girls and young women to achieve their dreams. Turning to our partners, we're working with Nike, Fox, Coke, Johnson & Johnson, Secret and Volpe Foods to make this Women's World Cup the largest promotional platform ever for the sport in this country. And in late May and June, it will be hard to avoid the excitement, the excitement around the games in France. The men's team will play in the Gold Cup in June, looking to win again as we did in 2017. Additionally, this fall, the team will participate in the inaugural CONCACAF Nations League, looking to advance to the Final Four next March. With a young player pool, the learning curve will be steep, but we are encouraged by the first two matches of this year. On the youth side, the men's under-17 qualifying tournament is in May and the World Championship in the fall. And as Carlos mentioned, our men's under-20s have already qualified for their World Cup in Poland. Of course, developing world-class players takes time and our long-term efforts continue as we improve our coaching education platform with more courses and digital access in both English and coming soon, Spanish language grassroots courses. We have seen an increasing number of young players get playing time in Major League Soccer and Europe, the result of the, of the development efforts of clubs across the country. So thank you for your commitment to the player development process. But before a player competes at the professional level, they have to start somewhere. This is an area that we have been studying for the past two years and 
one that together we need to continue to focus and tackle, and that's participation. While the sport has grown in nearly every aspect, registered players have been flat for a number of years. Providing a positive environment at the entry level and providing an aligned pathway for players to progress in the game is critical to attract and retain players. At last year's member meetings, we share the details of extensive research we have concluded in this space, and we look forward to continu continuing to discuss this subject at this year's sessions, which will take place in April at the new National Soccer Hall of Fame in Frisco, Texas. Your participation and commitment to these meetings makes a difference. I'd also like to acknowledge the work being done by the Youth Task Force. We now have six working groups, as Carlos mentioned, including one dedicated to creating solutions for our collective desire to grow the youth and the adult membership across our country. This is important work, and I'd like to thank my co-chair, Cindy Cohn, and all of the other people who are supporting this effort. We have been working, with our, working hard with our partner, Soccer United Marketing, to increase corporate support to improve our ability to spread our brand message and connect to fans. And the start of 2019 has seen us add Volkswagen as our first ever presenting sponsor. This unique partnership will see us connect to fans across the country and extend our education and development initiatives through the Volkswagen One Goal program, which is designed to support U.S. soccer's focus on delivering inclusion and accessibility to players, coaches, referees, and fans of the sport. We have also added delight to our blue chip roster of commercial partners. Furthering our efforts to connect to fans in deeper, more meaningful ways, we will launch an entirely new digital experience for U.S. soccer this spring. With our first ever fan-facing app and new website, we will exponentially increase our ability to connect to fans in deeper, more meaningful ways and provide unique experiences that only we can supply. This year, we will expand our Open Cup broadcast coverage and we'll be soon announcing a deal with one of our partners that will provide an unprecedented level of access for fans during the entire competition. Finally, a number of years ago, we focused on diversity within our staff because we believe that having a diverse workforce accelerates our ability to achieve our mission, that different points of view allow us to see the world more clearly and with a greater understanding. To that end, we have significantly increased the diversity of our workforce through thoughtful and targeted efforts at recruiting, and retaining talented women and people of color. At the same time, our national teams are increasingly diverse, reflecting the evolving demographics of our country. This is and will continue to be an area of opportunity for us as an organization and for our sport as a whole. As I mentioned earlier in my remarks, we continue to see value creation at the commercial level. And while that is important for many reasons, it's a critical part of our future plans. As part of the budget process, the Budget Committee asks us to provide an accelerated spending plan based on our best estimates of future revenues. So to be clear, our deficit spending position in fiscal 20 and over the next several years is based on accelerating our programming to grow the game while looking to increase our revenues starting in the next quadrennium. Thus, we are investing today with an eye on our future, which we believe is very bright. With that overview, I now would like to introduce Richard Muller, our treasurer, to formally present the fiscal 20 budget for approval. Thank you. Thank you, Dan. Good morning, everyone, and thank you for the opportunity to speak with you today. You have in your AGM advanced materials the proposed budget for fiscal year 20. 20. As this was my first year as the chair of the Budget and Finance Committee, I wanted to give you a sense of the process that we go through as a committee to create the budget. We start with our strategic plan, which is driving us towards our mission of making soccer the preeminent sport in the United States. The Federation is in year two of a five-year enhanced investment plan, which has us operating in a deficit position. This is planned through 2022 and is designed to increase our performance on and off the field as we look to renew our commercial agreements beyond the 2022 timeframe. This August, or past August, we started a budget process by reviewing the five-year framework 
from the Board of Directors discussing the key revenue and expense drivers in the context of the framework and then looking more closely at fiscal year 2020 and the drivers and opportunities that we would project. In October of last year, we had more granular discussions of the fiscal year 2020 drivers, opportunities, and tied that into how we were going to measure efforts so we can track our progress. With these parameters in place, the staff continued the work on creating the budget. So you have the committee and the staff working on this. It's a very, very, very uh, big process. Then in November, we had our final discussions and review of the fiscal 2020 budget in its entirety, along with how it would fit into our five-year investment plan. After an in-depth conversation, the Budget and Finance Committee voted unanimously to recommend approval of the budget to the Board of Directors. In December of last year, the Board also unanimously approved the fiscal year 2020 budget. With that background, I want to call out a few of the highlights of the budget itself. Number one, the Women's World Cup. This will be our largest investment in activation to date around the competition. Number two, digital infrastructure. We unveil our new digital platforms, both website and an app which will connect us with the fans like never before. Number three, program development. The continued evolution and expansion of our stakeholder area, including international relations, referee program evolution, licensing, education, and evaluation, continued evolution of our youth national teams program, and an integration with our player development programming. Number four was the men's national team playing in the Gold Cup and the inaugural CONCACAF Nations League. And number five, open cup improvements. I would also like to highlight funding we received from FIFA. We're very appreciative. as part of its global FIFA forward program. United States Soccer applies for funding for FIFA as part of its global FIFA forward program. This program is FIFA's effort to support specific individual federation projects that are aligned with FIFA's own strategic initiatives. For the three-year period 2016, sorry, 2016 to 2018, with the support and guidance from FIFA, we have received $2,250,000 that went towards several projects, which include the following. The development of four online grassroots coaching courses, that was $535,000. The development of an online grassroots refereeing course, that was $587,500. Our first Girls Academy Director course, that was $196,458. The development of an Academy Summer Showcase, which supported players, coaches, referees, high performance, and scouts, $397,005. The Development Academy Winter Showcase, which also supported players, coaches, referees, high performance, and scouts, that was $515,425. So as part of FIFA's forward commitment, we are required to submit to a statutory audit, which as you know, we conduct on an annual basis, as well as a FIFA forward programmatic audit, including multiple impact and milestone reports for each project that we do. I'm pleased to report that we received very high marks from FIFA on the programmatic audit and are in full compliance with all requirements. Moving forward, the staff at Soccer House will continue to manage this program heading into a new FIFA Forward 2.0 funding period for the years 2019 through 2022. We will report back to the National Council each year or as necessary to confirm the status of our FIFA forwarding pro uh, funding. So all in all, the budgeted deficit for fiscal year 2020 is similar to that of fiscal year 2019. For FY20, we are budgeting a deficit of $14,263,320. While in fiscal year 19, we were projecting a deficit of $13,697,629. and $629. We're investing for the future. Overall, the Federation remains in excellent financial shape and will continue to be in the future. I wanted to thank the committee for the work on the budget I'd like to make a special announcement of some of the members, Carlos Bocanegra, Steve Malik, John Mata, 
and Dr. Pete Zofi. I also want to thank the staff at U.S. Soccer for their work on this process. And finally, I wanted to take a minute to introduce our new CFO of U.S. Soccer, Pinky Reyna. Welcome. Pinky joined us in January, and we look forward to working with her in the coming year. Now I would like to call for a motion to approve the FY20 budget. Hold on. Actually, hold on a second. Uh, thank you for your support. It's not, <laughs> it's not I that could do this. I have to bring on someone else. Sorry, when I have a microphone, I always want to like sing like karaoke or something, so this is a little bit weird. This is not the time. Uh, I know, definitely not the time. <laughs> U.S. Soccer Senior Counsel Greg Fike will be presiding over the membership approvals process. Um, I'm sorry. I, I, I apologize. Yeah, sorry. All right. It's my first time. So uh, I would like to get a motion to approve. We have so moved. Do I have a second? All in favor? Aye. Anyone opposed? Okay, thank you very much. Appreciate your time. Thank you for your support again, and uh, thank you all on the Budget Committee for all your help. Um, U.S. Soccer Senior Counsel Greg Fike will be presiding over the membership approval yep. process now. Greg, if you'd like to come up. Thank you. Thank you, Richard. Uh, and welcome and thank you uh, all for allowing me to address you today. Uh, and I'm gonna be talking about the membership applications that you have in your book today. Included in your book of reports that was previously distributed, there are three membership applications that have been previously been approved by the Board of Directors. The first application is from ANFEEU to be an other affiliate member of U.S. Soccer. The second application is from U.S. Youth Futsal to be a national affiliate member of U.S. Soccer. The third application is from the United States Association of Blind Athletes to be a disabled service organization member of U.S. Soccer. In order to recognize each of these potential new members, we will address each of these applications separately. Membership applications require approval of the majority of the National Council. Unless there is an objection, we will handle the membership applications by the general consent process. If any representatives are present uh, from the applicants, they will have an opportunity to speak during uh, Go to the Game. So the first membership application is for ANF EU to be an other affiliate member. They were approved by the Board of Directors as a provisional member about a year ago. Since that time, they have added a few additional uh, leagues in additional states. Unless there is an objection, ANF EU's membership will be approved by the general consent. Hearing no objection, let's welcome ANF EU as a member of U.S. Soccer. The second membership application is for U.S. Youth Futsal to be a national affiliate member. They were approved by the board as a provisional member a few months ago. Unless there is an objection, U.S. Youth Futsal's membership is approved by the general consent. Let's welcome U.S. Youth Futsal as a member of U.S. Soccer. Last but not least, the third membership application is for the United States Association of Blind Athletes to be a disabled service organization member of U.S. Soccer. They were approved again by the board uh, as a provisional member a few months ago. So unless there is an objection uh, to the blind athletes, uh, United States Association of Blind Athletes membership is approved by the general consent of this body. Hearing no objection, let's welcome them as a member of U.S. Soccer. I would now uh, ask, uh, recognize our Chief Legal Officer, Lydia Waukee, uh, to present the bylaw amendments. Thank you. Thanks, Greg. Included in your book of reports in Section 6 are a series of bylaw amendments. As required by Bylaw 802, all of the proposed amendments have been reviewed by the Rules Committee and their reports are included in the book of reports. We will now proceed to consideration of the proposed bylaw amendments. 
There are some changes to the set of proposed amendments proposed by the Secretary General. The proposed amendments to bylaws 102, 103, 211, and 212 are being withdrawn. <clears throat> In regard to the proposed amendment to bylaw 241 on pages 14 and 15 of the Secretary General's amendments in the bylaws section of the Book of Rules, there is a small change to the proposal as made in the book. The proposed additional language in section two will no longer be inserted. Please strike out that bolded language. The proposed additional language in bold in section three is still in the proposed amendment. Therefore, as proposed, bylaw 241 only includes changes in section three. All of the amendments proposed by the Secretary General are recommended by the board. <clears throat> it is proposed to consider all of the amendments proposed by the Secretary General together on block under the consent agenda procedure. These are the proposed amendments to bylaws 241 with the change mentioned earlier, 402, 411, 431, 541, and 708. If there is no objection, Bylaws 241, 402, 411, 431, 541, and 708 are hereby approved on block. <clears throat> the next item for consideration is the proposed amendment to bylaw 322. The amendment is proposed by the Athletes Council and is included in your book of reports in the bylaws section after the Secretary General's proposals. The proposal is to change the term of the athletes' representatives on the board from two years to four years. The proposed amendment has been reviewed by the Rules Committee and their report is included in the Book of Reports immediately following the rationale for the proposed change. This amendment has also been recommended by the board. Is there any discussion? Okay. The question is on adoption of a proposed amendment to bylaw 322 is found in the bylaws section in the Book of Rules. The motion requires a two-thirds vote for adoption, and the vote will be taken by keypad. Are you ready? Are you ready for the question? <clears throat> Mr. Kepner, please proceed with the vote. You can begin voting. Five, count down now, four, thank you. The vote is 91.7% of the weighted vote in favor and 8.3% opposed. Uh, therefore, there are two thirds in the affirmative and the motion is adopted by law 322 is amended as proposed. Thank you. The next item for consideration is the proposed amendment to bylaw 413. The amendment is proposed by the United Soccer Coaches, Con United Soccer Coaches Association, sorry, I just went to the convention, and is included in your book of reports and in the bylaws section after the Athletes Council proposal. <clears throat> the proposal is to change the eligibility and voting requirements for the at-large position on the board of directors. The proposed amendment has been reviewed by the Rules Committee and their report is included in the Book of Reports immediately following the rationale for the proposed change. Is there any discussion? Chair recognizes Mr. Ahrens. Thanks. Um, but on behalf of the Athletes Council, uh, this is an area that we'd like to have further discussion on and so we would like to propose sending it back to the Rules Committee. It has been moved to uh, put this to the Rules Committee. Is there a second? It has been moved and seconded to refer the proposed amendments to Rule 13, 413 to the Rules Committee for further study and recommendation. 
Hearing no objections, the Rules Committee will report back at the next AGM. There, there's we an do, objection. I'm sorry, there is an objection. There is an objection? There is an objection. Okay, let's go ahead and hear the objection. I can barely see, I'm sorry. Dave Guthrie, Don't Indiana. Yeah. Oh, we're going to take a vote, actually, then. Oh, thank you very much, Michael. I appreciate this. Parliamentary procedure, folks. So we're going to go ahead and vote on whether to refer this bylaw amendment 413 to the Rules Committee for next year. Excuse and me. I think you should have discussion before a vote. Uh, okay, we'll take one on each side, sure. Dave, do you want to go ahead and speak? Yes, thank you. <clears throat> Thank you. We have 30,000 coaches that are members of this organization that the current language does not provide them to have a vote for the representative. We also had 2.3 million men and women in uniform, 50,000 of which are playing on one of the 800 bases for the United States. They also represent us, these military folks, represent us internationally in their play. They don't have a vote. Now, as this body, I've been here for now 20 years, and we've had a lot of discussion, we've had arguments, sometimes more spirited than others, but what I've never seen is us to, to vote in favor of unfairness. This is the United States Soccer Association. It is the United States of America. Our core values are that we provide a voice to all members, regardless of their size, their shape, their color, or whether they're in a wheelchair or they're standing. Not only do I think this bylaw will pass, but I would invoke this body to make sure that those numbers that come up there are 100%. This is being streamed, live stream. Of those 2.3 million military folks and the innumerable number of folks who have worn the uniform, many of whom are in this room, I would not only invite you to stand or to vote in favor, but I would invite you to stand and show our appreciation for not only their membership, but for their courage and their service. Lynn Burling Manual. I am CEO of United Soccer Coaches. And actually, we brought this amendment forward originally not because we expected it to be easy, but to quote John Kennedy, because we thought it would be hard. And the reality is, is that I appreciate the Rules Committee's concerns and I appreciate the Athletes Council's concerns. We respect everyone and the job that they do. However, we had um, prepared in advance a amendment to the amendment that slightly narrowed the scope to address the amendment to address the Rules Committee's concerns. It has been pending, it has been, an opinion has been offered by Tim Pinto of the Rules Committee that it did, it did indeed serve that purpose because that never came up as a question throughout any of the presentations that we have done through this entire weekend. We frankly had hoped that we could make this as simple as possible and simply bring the original mm -hmm. amendment forward. If, and again, I am not a parliamentarian and I am the worst Robert's Rules of Order person on earth, um, but we would frankly like to get our opportunity to address the amendment, um, the original amendment, and we would ask that it, whatever is the appropriate approach here, that that amendment come forward today and not be returned to the Rules Committee. Okay, we've heard uh, two cons. Do we hear a pro for forwarding it to the Rules Committee? Let's hear a pro. L Lydia? Yeah, John? <laughs> Hi, John Collins. Um, I happen to be the at-large director on the board, um, but I will note that I'm not seeking office again, so it doesn't impact me. Uh, so I'm not conflicted on this point. Um, couple things, or three things maybe. One, the at-large committee met yesterday discuss this, and the at-large committee is in favor of openness, um, and so they're not opposed to this um, coming in. That said, in the context of that discussion, there were a number of issues raised as to how the votes are weighted within the at-large committee 
and the at-large group discussed having a conversation over the next year to figure out how the vote should be weighted. So it is already undertaking its own look at bringing something back to this board or to this body, uh, possibly next year to do it. Um, with respect to the bylaw proposal that it's up now, under our bylaws, if it were passed today, it would not become effective until May 1st. So on a practical level, the, even if it's passed today, the election for this seat, which is to happen between now and March 18th, they would not be participating in because of how it, the implementation of our rules comes. So moving it to the Rules Committee to look at for an extra year does not have an actual practical effect with respect to this year. Um, so, and, and then today I have heard some issues were raised because, uh, and nobody has an issue with the military coming in and voting and anything like that. The Coaches Association, they understand the coaches are here. Many of the coaches are represented, some are not. Some are high school and college coaches. And they think a discussion with respect to having coaches represented is an important discussion to have as a body. Whether it's to vote for this position or to vote for something else, it's certainly something to be there. And there's been some concern whether the associate member, as it's defined, and organization members could mean players, someone that has no participants at all. It doesn't have coaches or it doesn't have referees or it doesn't have players. And if that sort of organization, which is able to come in under our bylaws, came in, could have a distorted vote if it came to the body. So with those issues in mind, um, the athletes came to me this morning and told me that they had issues with it. I've heard others have said they have issues with it. So it has nothing, moving it to the Rules Committee would have nothing to do with in, in negative comment in any way with respect to the U.S. coaches. United, sorry, I know you don't want to know. It's okay. United Coaches Association. I think I got that right. No, I missed one. No, you didn't, but it's okay. It's United Soccer Coaches. <laughs> okay. <laughs> it's only a two-year-old name, okay? I, I didn't call it its old name, at least. Um, or the military. They, we would we like to find a way for them to come in and participate. Everybody wants the participants to have a seat at the table, but we want to make sure that if it's somebody that has some other ancillary thing that's related to soccer comes in, isn't necessarily there. So those are the concerns that were raised. And since there's a practical matter, it's not going to impact the election before March 18th anyhow. Um, passing it to the Rules Committee could resolve this where everything comes forward with a plan that everybody supports and would pass unanimously next year as the other bylaws did. So in, with that, um, I personally, not from what was said in the room yesterday, but I personally would support sending it for the greater discussion. May I respond Can to that at all? Is that appropriate? Uh, let's, we'll, we'll get back to you, Lynn. Let's, um... I'm not going anywhere. It's good. <laughs> of course you're not. <laughs> Come up here, girl. a moment to respond as the main proponent, and then we'll give Lynn a chance to respond. Thanks. I want to just offer some context. Um, I, John, I would slightly disagree with you. I don't know. I, my group does not, I don't think issues is the right way to put it. And we're certainly not recommending this so that it goes back to the Rules Committee to die. We're actually absolutely recommending this so that we can go deeper on this discussion and have a much stronger understanding of it. Um, so the intent, Lynn, was not to send it so that it doesn't come forward again or anything like that. It's just that so we can go much deeper on the conversation. All right, now let's give Lynn another chance. And I appreciate that position. However, I believe that um, again, and I've spoken with many of you, and my colleague here is Marine Lieutenant Colonel Jennifer Farina, who address, excuse me, who represents the U.S. Armed Forces Sports Council. We are the two members today. It could be. It was more in the past, it could be less in the future. But we represent a category of membership, which is associate members, as John has pointed out. During the course of this last two days and in the weeks preceding it since the amendment was presented, none of these issues were brought forward other than the Rules Committee statement. I appreciate the concerns. Um, we don't believe those are valid, frankly, and quite honestly, what we would ask for is still to proceed with this specific vote today. John is correct. There will be a larger conversation by the at-large group, 
um, regarding weighting of votes as we go into the future. And that was discussed going into this amendment process. It was decided by the at-large group, which is honestly the only group that is affected with this motion, or excuse me, with this amendment, that really they were separate conversations. We are two members of this association, long-term members. We have the ability to vote and have done so for the budget this morning. We have the ability to vote for bylaws, which we have done so this morning. We have the ability to vote for officers. We have the ability to nominate board members. We have the ability to run for this board position. The only ability we do not have is a single vote for the board position. So we appreciate the concerns. Um, we have found most, none of the members we have spoken to have addressed them. And again, we would ask for this not to go back to the Rules Committee, but to be voted on today. Quite frankly, if I were to make an amendment to the amendment this morning, it would be to address John's issue, which would be to bring this to immediate um, implementation so that we are allowed to vote for this, uh, this election. And it has nothing to do with the candidates, simply the right of fairness and representation. Annie, we're not there just yet. <laughs> So we're not actually voting on the bylaw amendment now, so let's Correct. go ahead and see if we can take a vote on whether or not to refer it to the committee. So, Excuse me. I'm sorry. Uh, my name is Andrew Hiley. I'm with the United Soccer Coaches Board of Directors. Lynn has also made a motion to amend our proposal. Uh, we're not there yet. Okay, but What's our motion table? takes precedent over the motion to indefinitely suspend. No, it doesn't. Under and Robert's Rules of Order, it does, which is what governs in this assembly. Our parliamentarian is telling me that a motion to refer has a higher priority than a motion to amend. I understood it as a motion to suspend indefinitely that was made previously? No. Okay, no. all right. No. So, all right, so let's go ahead and proceed. Again, we are not voting on the amendment itself. Uh, the question and what has been moved and seconded is to refer the proposed amendments to Rule 413 back to the Rules Committee. So this doesn't kill the amendment, it refers it back to the Rules Committee for further study and recommendation. And the Rules Committee would report back at the next AGM. This is a vote by majority. Mr. Kepner? Begin voting now. Countdown five, thank you. 59.8% have voted yes to refer the proposed amendments to rule 413 back to the rules committee. Uh, since this is by a majority of vote, uh, this motion carries. And so rule 413 is going to be, the amendment to rule 413 is going to be referred back to the rules committee. Again, the Rules Committee will report back. It is possible that this amendment will come back for the next AGM. Lydia, may I make one more comment, <clears throat> just a closing? Sure, absolutely, Lynn. As I said coming in, we didn't do this because it was easy. We did it because we knew it could be hard. Um, I want to thank everybody for their support. I regret this decision, but we will be back in a year. And I thank you all for the work that you did on our behalf, and we appreciate the opportunity to be an active, engaged member of our federation. Thank you very much. Chair recognizes the young lady here. Thank you. Um, I appreciate the support. It's been an interesting uh, conference this year because it has taken on a different direction. Last year I was here, I chose not to wear the uniform, and I have all right to wear the uniform. I wore it this year, and I had more people come up to me, thank, thank me for my service, and then I recognized also so many people here that have already served. 
sacrificed, and I want to thank you all for your sacrifice. So Gavin Sivian, I'll tell you one thing. I, I, it was very discreet. It's very humbling to see that a wounded warrior has been able to transition and to stand as an example of how to transition from an active duty with sacrifice and discipline and to be able to be where you are as a poster for the people that are active duty and for the veterans. And I say this because the angle that we've taken is inclusion, grassroots, representation, commitment, and as a Marine, honor, courage, and commitment. And so again, I thank you all for your support, but the only thing I would leave with is the message that we've been stamping here is inclusion, representation, and accountability. Thank you. Before I proceed, I just want to thank you both for that show of, of grace, really, in the face of defeat. And I think that's something that all of our young athletes can learn from. So bravo to each of you. This concludes consideration of the proposed bylaw amendments. The next item of business is consideration of the ratification of policies. So the chair is going to recognize senior counsel Greg Fike. Thank you, Lydia. Uh, included, so we're now into the uh, policy section of your book of reports. Uh, included in your book of reports, there's two different sets of policy amendments. The first uh, of the two are two versions of policy 414-1, uh, proposed by uh, John Collins and uh, Tom Moore from California North, respectively. Uh, the second are a set of policy amendments that have been approved by the board throughout the last year. We'll, we'll go ahead and take them in order. Uh, there's a slight change for policy 414-1. Uh, as you may have, as some of you may have heard uh, yesterday, uh, the board approved a slightly different version than either of the proposed policies in your book uh, that were originally included. This uh, came from a compromise between the two proponents of the amendments, uh, Tom and John. Uh, we have policy 414-1 as approved by the board ready to show on the screen. Can we please put that policy on the screen? Greg? Yep. Uh, as a point of order, since the 414 ones that were proposed uh, by Tom and I have been merged and then approved by the board, they're now active policies. Uh, I would withdraw the one that's in the book with respect to mine. I believe Tom is doing the same and, and will speak with respect to supporting the one that the board has actually passed. Thank you. Yeah, John, I, and I, I'll be happy to open it up. I want to give you a second to read that on the screen. I think you have it. So this, this policy is the one that will be now, now considered. I'd like to recognize Tom, if he could come to the uh, microphone uh, to address the issue. Thank you. Thank you very much, Craig. Appreciate it. Um, so uh, first of all, this is a compromise. And uh, given the way national, sometimes state and even local politics go nowadays, where a lot of folks get entrenched and don't compromise. I think in this instance, we would uh, owe to John and Greg and Carlos and indeed the entire National Board of Directors, uh, perhaps a round of applause for choosing to compromise and come to an issue uh, that I think will benefit all of us. So if I might offer first a round of applause for them for doing a compromise. Thank you. So if it's not out of order, I'd like to move to approve the affirmation of the new policy 414-1 as recommended by the National Board of Directors. Motion is uh, in order. Uh, is there a second? Second. second. Uh, the, um, the policy 414 is approved by the Board of Directors will now be considered. So un unless there's an objection to policy 414-1, it will be ratified by the general consent of the body. Hearing no objection, it is ratified and approved. Thank you. You're welcome. Thank you, Tom. 
So the second set, as I mentioned earlier, were the policies that were previously approved by the Board of Directors. Uh, they're included in your book of reports. Just for uh, good order, I'm going to go ahead and, and list the, which policies those are. Uh, the policy 102-4-1 uh, of the Lamar Hunt U.S. Open Cup policy. Policy 401-1, USSF nomination and campaign process for the USSF president and vice president. And uh, importantly, uh, all of them are important with this one, especially policy 212-3, U.S. soccer athlete and participant safety policy. So the question before the body is whether to ratify the policy amendments that were just identified. Unless there's an objection, the policy amendments uh, just identified are ratified by general consent. Thank you very much. Carlos, the chair is yours. Well, thank you, Greg, Lydia, Richard, and Dan. As you all know, our federation and our board of directors benefit from the service and contributions of independent directors. Our independent directors are selected because they bring unique experience, expertise, often from the private sector, that help make our federation even stronger and more effective. They are truly independent. They do not represent any member of our federation. They are tasked with providing impartial advice and counsel. I am very grateful that you gave me the opportunity to begin my service here at the Federation as an independent director. Over the past couple years, two years actually, we've benefited from the contributions of Val Ackerman as an independent director. Val's voice and perspectives have been greatly appreciated. And while Val has decided not to seek a second term and was unable to join us today, we wish her the very best and we thank Val for her valuable contributions to U.S. soccer. So today, we're considering a candidate to fill this vacancy. At the board level, our nominating and governance committee, along with an independent outside firm, conducted a rigorous search and reviewed and interviewed numerous candidates. The committee presented its recommendation to the board, which accepted it and now presents this candidate for your consideration. Let me first thank John Collins and the members of the committee for their commitment and diligence in this process and for putting forward such a strong candidate, Patty Hart. Patty, who joins us today, has more than 40 years of private sector experience. She's a highly respected leader in the gaming industry. She's helped grow and lead major companies. And with her, her experience as a business leader and as a CEO, Patty brings deep expertise in technology, entertainment and gaming, and a passion, I might add, for sports and soccer all of which make her an ideal candidate for independent director. She will also be our first chair of our commercial committee. So with that, all those in favor of the election of Patty Hart as an independent director, please say aye. aye. Any, any opposed? Well done, ayes have it. Congratulations, Patty. And on behalf of all of us, welcome to US Soccer. Last year's presidential election in Orlando also left a vacancy for vice president. In accordance with our bylaws and our policies, the nomination process for vice president was public and opened in November, closed in December. One candidate completed the nomination process, Cindy Parlo Cohn. Now, I'm not going to spend a lot of time reciting Cindy's lifetime of experience. We'd be here all day. But as an active member of our soccer family for more than two decades, many of you know her well. As a player, she helped lead our women's national team to a World Cup victory in 1999, to two Olympic gold medals after that. And as a pro, she helped pioneer and play in our first women's professional soccer league, the WUSA. As a coach, she has mentored and developed players at nearly every level including the NWSL as the first coach of the Portland Thorns, winning that league's first ever championship seven years ago. As a member of our federation, she has taken on numerous responsibilities, including as a past member of our board, representing the Athlete Council. Today, she continues as a non-voting advisor to our council, Athletes Council, and as a co-chair with Dan of our Youth Task Force. And for her life of achievement, we were thrilled, thrilled this past fall to induct Cindy to
to the National Soccer Hall of Fame. Cindy, we're very grateful that you have submitted your nomination to take on even more responsibility in helping to lead this federation. This election is to fill the remaining one year of the current term for vice president. At our AGM next year, there will be another election for a full four-year term. So, since we have only one candidate for this office, we're going to conduct this election by voice vote. All those in favor of the election of Cindy Parlacone as vice president, please say yes or aye. aye. I think the ayes have it. Everyone, please join me in welcoming our new vice president of U.S. Soccer, Cindy Parlacone. Thank you. It is such an honor to stand here today as your vice president. Thank you for having the confidence in me as I step into this new role. I am passionately driven to positively impact our game at all levels and across all demographics. And just so you know, I will lean heavily on you to help me do that because this is a collaboration among all of us. My objective as VP is to be an active, an impassioned advocate for all of you who move and develop our game on a daily basis. I believe that with my extensive knowledge of and experience working in the soccer landscape of our country, from grassroots to the international level, I can help us continue to build, develop, and grow soccer in the U.S. Together, we will improve the experiences of everyone in our great game. I look forward to working with all of you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much, Cindy. <clears throat> With her experience as a player, a coach, a leader, a friend to so many people across our federation, I can't imagine a better person for this job. And let me just say as president at a very personal level, Cindy, how grateful I am that you've taken on this role to include, as I mentioned earlier, taking the ta agreeing to help lead our new strategic review of women's soccer. So we're truly, truly excited to have you on board. Let me also note a couple other changes at the board here at the Board of Directors. As her term comes to an end, I ask you to please join me in thanking Angela Hookles for her valued service as an athlete representative on the board and for co-chairing with Carlos Bocanegra of the Technical Development Committee. Th thank you, Angela. <clears throat> and finally, I want to thank John Collins a long-standing at-large board member who has decided not to seek re-election at the end of his term next month. So this will be John's last in-person board meeting as well. John, we're very grateful to you for your wise counsel, for chairing our nominating and governance committee. Thank you very much. We uh, <clears throat> began our meeting today by saluting our great life members. And I can report that the Board of Directors recently approved the nomination of our newest life member, Richard Groff. For over more than three decades, Richard has strengthened soccer at every level. From leading Pennsylvania youth soccer and U.S. adult soccer to the American Professional Soccer League, paving the way for MLS to helping build the men's and the women's game, to serving on the board of our federation and the U.S. Soccer Foundation, Five years ago, Richard was recognized with the Warner Fricker Builder Award. And today, by acclamation, we are proud to welcome Richard Groff as our newest life member. Richard, please stand up. have been getting up a lot today. We're not done yet. <laughs> now, now, for one of our great traditions here at U.S. Soccer, for the good of the game. And before I do that, 
I want to acknowledge all our past, maybe present, national team players, men and women who are here today, be it on the Athlete Council or in any other capacity, please stand up and be recognized. National team players. Before we open it, uh, the, the floor up for, um, for the good of the game, I, I want to begin by inviting one of our special guests to give, them, give him an opportunity to say a few words. Our great partner, friend, CONCACAF President, Victor Montagliani. Thank you, Carlos. Gracias. Uh, good morning, everyone. <clears throat> it's nice to see spirited debate alive and healthy in, the, in our region. Um, not something that we could have said even a few years ago. Um, it's a real honor and pleasure to be here uh, in front of the members of U.S. Soccer. Uh, I'd like to acknowledge, first and foremost, some of the key members that I get to work with uh, on a regular basis, first and foremost, FIFA Council member Sunil Galati, your past president. A key stakeholder, not only uh, in our region, but also at the FIFA level, and now a member of the Stakeholders Committee, Commissioner Don Garber. And also um, my vice president when I was at Canadian Soccer for many years, and my dear friend and now current president, uh, Steve Reed. I'd like to also acknowledge all the councils here, um, and also specifically the athlete councils, uh, who I've had the privilege of going, coming to speak to uh, the last few years. I always enjoy uh, being around players. I think it's very important that, um, and I'm glad we're talking about the good of the game, and, and I think uh, to me it was actually a real pleasure, Carlos, that you introduced the national team players, uh, because I think uh, at the end of the day we all start out this game uh, as, as players either in our mind or in our heart, some of us go on to be good players, some of us go on to be legends in our own minds. But it was a real pleasure to be, uh, to be with the Athlete Council yesterday, so I want to have a special shout out to them. <clears throat> CONCACAF. <clears throat> um, you know, um, I think one of the things that uh, I've now been president almost three years, um, and uh, it will be three years in May, we have our Congress coming up. And... Um, We've come through a lot in this region, uh, as a lot of you in this room know. Um, but I think uh, what I'm most proud about, and I'm glad that I'm speaking uh, after the good of the game um, title was put up, is that we've brought football, I think, back to the region. And the discussion really has been about football. Uh, and we have our, some of our colleagues here, obviously, from the FIFA family, uh, Jose and Jair, who we work closely with, and obviously UEFA, who's a dear friend of uh, U.S. soccer, but also of CONCACAF. Uh, I'd like to acknowledge them as well. But this year, as we know, is two, is, uh, two big uh, moments at the senior level. We have the Gold Cup, uh, which is, for the first time ever, we've expanded it to 16 teams, with two venues being outside of North America, one in Costa Rica and one soon to be announced in the Caribbean. And that is a sign of, of growth in our region, not just on the field, but also off the field. Uh, we have the Women's World Cup. Uh, and obviously, we have Alex Morgan, who was Player of the Year this year in CONCACAF, and also Alisa Nair, who was also Goalkeeper uh, of the Year in the region. And uh, obviously, as um, I, I think it was Dan that said that, uh, Jill says that they're just going to win another World Cup. And obviously, we have two other teams going there to represent one Canada, a very young team, but also I think one of the great stories that has come out of this region on the women's side is that for the first time ever, a Caribbean nation is going to represent CONCACAF at the Women's World Cup, Jamaica, which was a tremendous story where the entire nation, uh, after their qualification, welcomed them home. And, and, and to me, those are signs that on that side of the game that uh, this region has tremendous potential, not only to win the World Cup, but also to really light the flame of, uh, of women all, all across our region. The U-20 uh, Men's Championship, congratulations to Tab Ramos. I was, had the pleasure of also being there. 
and it was a, a tremendous tournament at the IMG facility. And 2018 was, was, a, was a World Cup year. Um, and um, a World Cup year, but also a, a watershed moment for this region. A watershed moment in this region because as we had started off this meeting, uh, the winning of the United 2026 bid. And I think as we look to that as our North Star uh, over the next seven, eight years, I think it's important though to take into context really what I think our next challenge is in this region. And when I say this region, I think obviously the U U.S. soccer, which is a key pillar and a major piston in the engine in our region, um, that our next frontier is really about culture and the culture of football. And what is the culture of football? You know, it's not about paying $200 million for a player. It's not about wages at 450,000 pounds a week. What culture is, is what we have in this region. For too long, I keep hearing that football or soccer is the future in this region. Well, it's not the future, ladies and gentlemen, it's the present. And I think it's time we start speaking with a different candor and a different tone, starting with our leaders in U.S. soccer in Mexico and the U.S. who did win the bid, but also throughout the region. We should be proud of the football culture we have here. Why? Because men and women can play the game equally. You can go to a game and the stadiums are full and you don't have to worry about the safety of your children and your family. We are leaders in world football, make no mistake about it. And it's about time we stand up and start telling the world that we are. And so as your CONCACAF president, I'm very happy and proud of the work U.S. soccer has done, not only in the past, but in the present. And I will be here to support you every step of the way. And to that end, we launched in November a strategic plan for CONCACAF. We launched a process, a process that will take 18 months, that will culminate at some point in 2020. And that process will involve all the stakeholders, all the stakeholders that are here present in this room all the stakeholders are in our region. And really what that strategic plan is, it's called CONCACAF 2030. And it is really answering the question, what will we be? What will CONCACAF look like? And what do we want it to look like in the year 2030? <clears throat> and when I say CONCACAF, that doesn't mean me and my staff in Miami or in Guatemala City or in Kingston, Jamaica. It means us. We are CONCACAF. And I think as we look on the tremendous growth that has happened and the potential growth, I think it's important to look at the football history, especially in our region in the U.S. and specifically in North America. Our history has shown that we can get somewhere alone very fast. But I think what the United bid has taught us is that we can get far together. And that is the key message as we move forward, as not only one nation, as your logo says, but also as one CONCACAF. And so to that end, I'd like to acknowledge your president with a little token of our appreciation from our CONCACAF family. Carlos, first and foremost, on behalf of the 41 nations that are listed behind here and the one CONCACAF family, I'd like to acknowledge not only um, my invitation here, but also, Carlos, I want to thank you on a personal level. You sit on the CONCACAF Council, you're a trusted team player by not only by the Council, but also all the members of our CONCACAF family. And I want to thank you for your service to CONCACAF, to the region, obviously to U.S. soccer. And at a personal level, thank you for being a friend. Thank you, Richard. Thank you. Victor, I can't let you leave just quite yet. As a Canadian, a very proud Canadian still, I never thought I'd, I'd see you with a U.S. jersey, but today... Neither did I.
So at this point, I'd like to make a special announcement. And earlier, we all heard from Dan Flynn. Dan has served as our CEO and Secretary General with distinction for the past 19 years, maybe longer than even he intended. And in particular, I'd say over the last 12 to 18 months, he's helped us ensure continuity and stability. Dan, I'm especially grateful to you for your partnership, your wise counsel, and friendship this past year. And so, it's, ve it's very bittersweet that we're announcing today that Dan will step down later this year, as we thank him for nearly 20 years of outstanding service. As with every senior position at the Federation, we'll conduct a thorough search for his successor and we'll work for a seamless transition. There will be many more opportunities in the future to thank Dan for his many contributions. But Dan, you didn't think we let you off that easy today, did you? <laughs> True to his Missouri roots, Dan is the very definition of Midwestern humility. He doesn't boast, he doesn't seek the limelight, and as a result, the scope of his impact is not always fully known on the outside. So I want to take this opportunity, if I may, today to briefly share a few highlights. And yes, Dan, we're going to embarrass you just a little. In Dan Flynn. <laughs> In Dan Flynn, our Federation found the proven experience of a player, a business leader, and a soccer executive. As a star defender in college, he helped St. Louis University win the 1973 NCAA Soccer Championship. And I'm told that back then, he also had a pretty, pretty amazing afro. Oh my God. <laughs> Wow, in business, in business, he became president of Anheuser-Busch International at the age of 31. And in leadership positions at US Soccer, so both at US Soccer and at the foundation, he helped fuel the growth of soccer in the late 1990s. Today, we see Dan's work as CEO in world-class facilities, from the National Training Center in Carson, California, to the National Training and Coaching Development Center in Kansas City to the brand new National Soccer Hall of Fame in Frisco, Texas. We see his work in a renewed focus on national team and player development, especially our youth. In fact, during his tenure, our women's national team won three Olympic gold medals and a World Cup. And we see Dan's work in the critical role he helped in some of our greatest successes, from hosting the 2003 Women's World Cup with just four months to prepare to the 2016 Copa America Centenario, which was a major boost to our financial security, to our successful bid to host the Men's World Cup in 2026. I have to point out, as many of you know, that Dan did this all in recent years while undergoing major surgery, a heart transplant, fully recovering and then getting back to work, often at a relentless pace. Dan is unstoppable. None of this comes without huge sacrifice. True, Dan has two great loves in his life, soccer and his family, but not in that order. All this time, his family has continued to live back home in St. Louis. Dan has commuted to Soccer House in Chicago just about every week for 25 years. And next month, he and his wife, Kathy, who's with us today, will celebrate their 41st wedding anniversary. On behalf of all of us, I want to thank Kathy and your daughters, Dan, Lauren, Annalise, and Aaron, their families, your grandchildren, for sharing Dan with, with us for all these years. Your legacy, Dan, will be felt in many other ways. So many, so many at Soccer House and people in this room today have their own stories. If they asked for five minutes of Dan's time, he'd give them 30. If they needed advice, he'd become a mentor. 
Dan, the example of your dedication, your decency, will continue to inspire those who have worked under you, the next generation of soccer leaders for many, many years to come. So I know I speak for many of us when I say that it's hard to imagine Soccer House without you. But you can look back on your tenure knowing that our federation and soccer in America is stronger than ever. In no small measure, Dan, because of you. So as I invite Dan to say a few words, I will ask you all please to join me in expressing our profound gratitude to our CEO, our friend, great champion of soccer in America, Dan Flynn. Thank you very much. Thank you. Well, I kind of pride myself on not being surprised, but I was uh, very surprised. Carlos, thank you for that wonderful introduction. And uh, somewhere, my wife, um, we're going to have a discussion about those pictures. But uh, <laughs> as Carlos was providing his wonderful introduction, I, I couldn't help but really stare at Hank. Hank and I are the only two people who have <clears throat> held this position really in about the last 30 years. And I will never forget the day I took over in the transition and Hank said to me, Dan, I will do anything to help you succeed. I will do anything to help you as soccer succeed. And so you, anybody that knows Hank, he's a man of his word. He was there when the quirky hours when I would call, when things maybe weren't going so well. I got a lot of calls when he said, hey, congratulations. First one to always call when we had success on the field. But I, what I most appreciate about Hank was when he would call me and kind of say, hey, Dan, I think you guys are maybe going off the rails a little bit. He provided an incredible balance. So Hank, thank you for your friendship. <laughs> Thanks for your mentorship. <laughs> so I'm frequently asked over the years, what's my favorite team? And obviously it's a trap question and one that I completely stay away from. But I will now reveal my favorite team today. It's my medical team. <laughs> obviously without them I wouldn't be here. So. But I, it would be impossible to thank all of my team members that, that I work with. I would be remiss and I'm going to try to just recognize by name the nine direct reports that I have. But they epitomize um, kind of the saying that it's not about recognition, it's about results. So Lydia, Jay, Brian, Pinky, Tanya, Neil, Nico, Asher, and Ernie, you make it easy to come in every day. It's easy to stay motivated, and you, mo you continue to motivate me. So thank you very much for your incredible dedication to U.S. soccer and making my job a whole lot easier. As I was thinking through my transition a number of years ago when Sunil and I were talking, I was going through my calendar and looking at all the meetings. And I did it for about, I don't know, five, six, seven years. And I kept noticing a certain name that would kind of pop up on my schedule. And then I realized, I said, heck, I'm spending more time with Jay Burhalter than I am my wife. <laughs> and so the transition proceeded. Sorry, Jay, but Kathy's better looking. <laughs> I do want to, you always run a little bit of a risk, uh, I mentioned nine people, but I, I do want to mention Jay in particular. He worked with me at the foundation and I was able to um, get him to come to U.S. soccer. He did leave U.S. soccer for a bit and we were lucky enough to recruit him back. Um, in any job, there's people that uh, stay late, give you really good advice, they give you honest advice, you don't always like to hear it. Uh, but I really couldn't have accomplished it's not me. We couldn't have accomplished a lot of what we've accomplished, quite frankly, without Jay. So, Jay, a special thank you. <clears throat> when Bob Canagulia and the board decided to hire me 18 and a half years ago, there really were two things that I thought we could do as an organization. One was build a brand, and the other was to try to find a way to be relevant in our sport 365 days a year. 
And if we accomplish both of those items, the financial success would kind of come along with it. And I think we've been able to accomplish that with the membership in, the, in this room. In terms of building the brand, you have to thank the athletes. They don the jersey, they wear the, the crest. What they do and the success on the field is so critically important to building our brand. But when they're playing for the national team, they go back. They have to have somewhere to go back to. And they go back to their clubs. And when you look at where we are today, we're first 20 years ago, that opportunity that has been provided by professional soccer in our country and the growth of that is really the reason that we are much more relevant as a sport. So I thank the athletes. I thank the grassroots at the youth and the adult level. You bring the joy to the game for the youngsters. You provide that platform of joy when they're adults. And on the relevancy, I just have to thank professional soccer. All three leagues, our women's league, NWSL, USL, and most of all, Don, I want to thank you for your leadership, incredible growth that you brought to our sport. Um, and in particular, and I've said this repeatedly, I'm not sure they get enough credit for the supporter culture that now exists in our country. These are fans that, they're not coming to the games. They're donning the scarves, they're going to the pubs, and they're marching the games. That's an incredible difference versus 20 years ago. And two, I know our fan councils here to the fans who support all the national teams. Thank you very much. I wanted to take, be very brief. I didn't know this was all happening. I'm kind of scrambling through this a little bit. I apologize, but I've served under four, but there've been five presidents that really have impacted my life. Um, Werner Fricker, the man simply believed when nobody else did. I was in the beer business and he asked him to arrange a meeting with the president of Anheuser-Busch, who was a big fan. By the end of that meeting, the president of Anheuser-Busch was ready to double down. But Werner believed when very few others really didn't believe. Alan Rothenberg, who is not here, but staging the World Cup was what everybody talked about. But he saw it a lot differently. It was a 30-day 30, 30 party in a platform, in a runway, to start a Division I men's league. Simply nothing less than spectacular. Bob Conagulia, thank you for hiring me. Uh, I would say of Bob the integrity of the process, focus on principles, stay focused on the important things, the how we get better. But we'll never forget it. He kept it very simple, very powerful. Sunil, thank you for your dedication to the the game. Thank you for your commitment to growth. And I will say this of Sunil that I don't think he's, deserved, he's gotten the credit for this particular point. He absolutely moved us to take risk. And that's not an easy thing to do, to move a member organization into a riskier proposition. But he built that in to the staff in such a way it became very common. Very difficult to do, but really needed in the 12-year run that you had. So thank you very much, Sunil. <laughs> Carlos, thank you for the kind introduction. I say of Carlos' vision. He presented a vision. You elected him in 18. Led the World Cup bid effort successfully. You heard today, Vision 2027. That's all balanced with a pursuit of excellence. It's a tough balance, but one that he handles quite well. So thank you, Carlos, not only for today and all the leaders and presidents, but thank you for what you're gonna do for US soccer in the years to come. So at the end of any journey, worthwhile journey, I think you take a, a moment and you kind of go back to your roots. And that's really what this is about for me. Reconnect a little bit, grandkids, family, friends that I've stayed connected with but haven't had a lot of personal contact. So, and with the grandkids, uh, particular Stella at seven, lives in Overland Park, and Danny and Jay in St. Louis, um, Missouri U Soccer and Kansas U Soccer, ready or not, here I come. <laughs> <laughs> so I wanna, I talked about my favorite team. I'm gonna talk about my toughest negotiation or conversation I ever had. 
and it's really an introduction to my wife, but when I was going and facing surgery, you're encouraged to talk about if you don't make it. It may sound kind of awkward today, so I designed this little get-together with my wife, and I said, look, if I don't make it, I want you to share your life with somebody else, and you know, it did not go well. <laughs> so I tried to add a little humor, and I said, uh, would you let him drive my car? Would you let him sleep on the same side of the bed? That was the end of that. <laughs> so it was a little chilly, and I said, if I only have one more question to ask you, would you let me do it? And I'll never ask you another question about this. She said, okay, if you promise. I said, I promise. So I said, would you let him use my golf clubs? <laughs> she said, don't worry about it. He's left-handed. <laughs> So I, I hope my wife is here. I, I don't see her, but, <laughs> and I, I, I will end, you know, really it's about in tough times, adding a little bit of humor and smiling and a little bit of collaboration, I think goes a long way. So I have everything to thank my wife about for allowing me to do this job all these years. And I will say publicly what I say to my wife every morning, I love the way you love me. So it's been an honor for 18 and a half years. It's been a privilege. Carlos, thank you for your kind introduction. I'm very grateful. Thank you. Tough act to follow. All right, and now for the good of the game. We are, after all, a membership organization, and this is another opportunity to make sure we're always hearing from you, our members. This is your federation. We want to hear what's on your mind, your successes, your concerns, your ideas. I'd ask, please, that you give your name and organization, keep your comments as brief as possible, so that everyone has an opportunity to speak. With that, the floor is open, and I'll take, is that Greg? Yes. There we go. Hi, uh, Greg Griffith, Georgia State Soccer Association. I just wanted to recognize what happened in Georgia this year uh, through Atlanta United and a great leader with Carlos Bocanegra up on stage. Um, in case you missed it, they won the MLS Cup this year, but they set single season attendance records of averaging 53,000. They had over 900,000 people come over 17 home games, set single season records for games with around 72,000 attending multiple games. We broke a record for MLS All-Star game attendance, broke a record for MLS Cup attendance, and the environment is just fantastic that they've created there. If you get a chance, it's sold out all the time, but if you get a chance and you want a scalpel ticket, you know, come on down. But I just wanted to say that thank you to Atlanta United for that because Ever since I got into the soccer business, when I tell someone what I do, almost second or third question they say is, you know, when's soccer going to make it big in this country? And now, thanks to Atlanta United, if you go to a game, we're here. We made it big. So thank you very much. Thank you, Greg. Tom Moore. Tom Moore, California Soccer Association North. Thank you very much to everyone for passing this new policy, 414-1 today. Um, and certainly it will mean a bit more work for the National Board of Directors, certainly a bit more work for the staff, but it's also an opportunity for all of us because as I look across the National Council here, I'm quite certain we have experts in financial management, IT, human resources, education. Uh, I would guess that perhaps we have a few experts in marketing and PR over on the Pro Council. Uh, Lord knows we have enough attorneys in the room. So uh, please take advantage of this opportunity because we're take, we've taken an important step towards open governance and your expertise can be useful in moving the game forward for all of us. Um, secondly, uh, 30 minutes after this meeting ends, a group of men and women from the Adult Council will be meeting out at the small field for some pickup soccer. 
And if I'd remembered my goalkeeper's gloves, I would throw them down on the ground because we are challenging the Athletes' Council to a game. <laughs> Rick. Rick Kelsey, Arizona Soccer Association. Just two things I want to encourage everybody to become a part of. Here in Arizona, we've launched a partnership with Clemson University. Um, this weekend, we're actually hosting um, 10 disabled veterans from Arizona, and we're putting them through their grassroots coaching license. Um, and it's a program we want to continue to do. I would encourage other states to reach out to Clemson University um, as they have a program that they've, they've launched this year. Also, we have um, a club here in Arizona uh, North Phoenix Christian Soccer Club that is 134 refugees. They actually came this weekend and helped U.S. soccer stuff the, the goodie bags you guys had. Um, it, was, it was an absolute amazing experience for me because as we were here, we went around and took the kids around the hotel. One of the kids said, wow, I feel rich. I was like, wow, that's kind of funny. Um, then we continued to walk around. We went by the pool. One of the window shades was opened. One of the kids looked into the hotel room and said, oh, look at that's a really cool bed. I wish I had a bed. These kids are in all of our communities. I encourage you to find them, bring them together. You have really, really good people, good organizations. When we look at the pay to play models we all hear about, these are the kids we wanna grab. These are the kids we wanna help. And it's a great opportunity. What we've also done this weekend is we've taken those, those kids in that club and they're the, they're the players that are being used by our vets. So we're integrating these two communities together. I encourage all of you to reach out to those, those two communities. Thank you. Thank you, Rick. Uh, David Boards, Rhode Island Soccer Association. First, just to double down on all of the uh, congratulations to Dan Flynn. Uh, he has been a model to us all and a great leader of this organization for, for a long time for everybody here. Second, uh, the reason that I that up I, in the spirit of one nation, one team, and the building of this sport, I have to speak with a small degree of disappointment today. Um, I found it uh, disappointing that uh, bylaw proposals, which are submitted to this body well in advance, and unfortunately only considered annually, uh, we were not able to support our Armed Services Sports Council request. A number of people in this room are disappointed by our action today. And I think we have to do better. Uh, that is a body in this country that clearly is part of one nation and one, and one team. Thank you. Thank you, David. Chris. Uh, Chris Branscombe, Eastern Pennsylvania. And on behalf of our state, I just want to congratulate uh, our friend and mentor, Richard Groff, on his selection as a life member. He's done so much for our area, our country, uh, me personally. Thanks, boss. You've done a great job. Um, and to a future life member, Dan Flynn, thank you for what you've done. Um, I guess I just nominated you. Um, I also just want to say that uh, hey, Philadelphia welcomes everybody the She Believes Cup on February 27th and uh, CONCACAF. We look forward to hosting Gold Cup games later in June. So tickets are available by now. Thank you. Thank you. Hi, I'm Jessica Malone speaking on behalf of the Fan Council. This is our second AGM that we've attended and we wanted to take time to thank all the regional councils and all the members who have let us stop by their meetings and get to meet you guys and learn about the important work that you're doing because that's something that sometimes the fans aren't as aware of as they should be. Uh, we want to thank everyone at U.S. Soccer who always takes the time to show us what goes on in the day-to-day -day operations. Um, Carlos, Jay, and Dan, thank you. And also to say congratulations to Cindy Parlo Cohen. We look forward to working with you over the next year. And to all of you, we hope to see you around at some games. Thanks. Thank you. Dave Laraba, West by God, Virginia. <laughs> you knew that was coming, I just had to do it. Uh, a couple quick things. Jennifer, Lieutenant Colonel, thank you for coming back this year. And thank you for proudly wearing your uniform. Well done, Maureen. Thank you for your service to our game and to our country. <clears throat> On a personal note and also a West Virginia note, Dan, thank you for your support and all you've done, both for West Virginia and for the game. And then my good long time, not say how many years, friend Richard, congratulations, well done. Finally, I 
was happened to be looking through because a couple people mentioned, you know, you said something last year for good at a game. Well, that's a surprise. And I looked and see what I said. I thought I remembered, but I wasn't sure. So I said, because of the crowd from last year and all the attendance, that I challenged everybody that was attending to come back. How many of you were here last year at the AGM? Could you raise your hand or stand up? Thank you. The second thing I said was I challenged the candidates to not walk away if they were not, that the ones that were not successful. I asked them to continue their service and several of them said they would. I would like all the candidates who ran for president last year to please stand up. Thank you, Carlos. Hank. I might get a bit emotional. Hank Steinbrecher, life member. Uh, Danny. Everyone knows we shared the same seat. They don't know the depth of the friendship that we've had. You've taken that chair to new, new heights. Today I pay homage to everything you've done for our sport and for the friendship that I've had for you over these many years. My only prayer is that God continues to bless you. Thank you for being such a dear friend and a dear friend to our game. God bless you, Dan. Sorry, Kurt. Kurt Regroot, New York West Youth Soccer. Uh, several years ago, when I became state president, I, as I attended national meetings, uh, purposely started to reach out to various members from the Federation, Caitlin, Brian, you, Carlos, Sunil, uh, Dan. And my intent was to try and advocate for more commitment to the youth soccer game. Um, I had a lot of doubters as I talked to people. Um, many said, you know, questioned whether I would, I would have much success. But there are others out there like me over the last few years who have done the same. Uh, it's very clear two years later, three years later, in your stated commitment that fixing youth soccer is a priority, that you've listened to us. And I just wanted to express our gratitude on behalf of all of us in the youth soccer game for listening for making that com commitment. We'll continue to press you, but we're grateful for the commitment and we look forward to that commitment going forward and the results of it. Thank you. Thank you, Kurt. Thank you, uh, Dan Pop from Washington Youth Soccer. I just wanna take a moment to, on behalf of Terry Fisher, our CEO, Felipe Mendez, our board vice president, and myself, to thank the uh, Innovate to Grow uh, committee and the organization for including Washington and our, our uh, grant bid uh, to be approved. There's a lot of growth happening in our country and your investment in those projects is paramount. As I sit as uh, one of many committee members on the Organizational Growth Committee with Dr. Sophie and the leadership from Bill Taylor from Idaho, we are working hard to define ways in which we bring new uh, kids into the game to um, engage communities that are not being engaged with today. And the Innovate to Grow uh, grant that we received and were approved for will be a huge step in central Washington for us to do just that. So on behalf of us and uh, for the rest of, of you who did not, I, I was listening to Carlos's comment earlier, if you did not submit for a grant, I strongly encourage you to do that is a very reasonable uh, process. Um, frankly, I think Jay said the other night, the, the, the bar is frankly pretty low. They want good programs that they can invest in, so I encourage you all to uh, submit in the next round. Uh, so thank you very much, we appreciate it. Thank you, Dan. <laughs> Richard. Richard Groff, and I'm honored to say life member. It's a great honor to join those incredible people sitting to our left and to thank each of you uh, for voting me in. I was a little nervous there for a while. 
This was been a, it has been a 30-year journey. And certainly I need to thank my friends at Eastern Pennsylvania Youth Soccer and Region 1 that started this journey. But I wouldn't be here today without the partners, the mentors, the advisors. Sunil, uh, Kevin, Hank, especially Dan, you've been remarkable in your guidance to keep me going. I love this organization, I love our teams, and I look forward to helping you grow this sport. Thank you. Lynn. Um, I'm not actually gonna say, uh, speak about the things that you probably think I'm going to speak about. <laughs> I'm just saying. Um, this is actually a moment that I wanna speak to Dan. And I am never, ever, ever gonna call you Danny, just so you know, uh, ever. Um, Dan and I first met at, at then NSCAA convention a lot of years ago in Atlanta, where he was pouring beer for Budweiser. And, um, and since that time, and it's more years than either of us would probably care to admit to. The hair was cut by then, though. I must admit, I'd never seen that before. And I just want to say thank you also. Uh, you have been a good friend and a good mentor. And one of the things that I've always appreciated is that we've been on the same side of the table occasionally. We've been on opposite sides of the table occasionally. You've been a tad salty from time to time, <laughs> but always direct and honest. And you've always said yes when you meant yes, and no when you said no when you meant no. And that has meant the world. I have learned so much from you. First in my days, my many, many days at Soccer America, then my years at AYSO, and now at United Soccer Coaches. And I want to thank you when we made the new rebrand from NSCAA United to United Soccer Coaches. That was a, a large and frightening step. And you came up to me and said, that was kind of a bold move, wasn't it, Lynn? And, uh, but you said it in a nice way, and I appreciate it, because there were a few people out there who were saying not such nice things. Um, I have killed their child, but I want to just say thank you for all that you have done. Um, we understand that you will be in Kansas City more often. So come on by Union Station, and we welcome you anytime. Thank you for everything. Mary Jane Bender, Illinois Youth Soccer. Um, looking back, I, I met Dan in, 26 years ago in 1993 when he was the head of the Chicago World Cup Committee. And he's always been honest with me. He told me things I sometimes didn't want to hear. I have a tremendous respect for Dan. Uh, he's been s supportive, um, a motivator, and... I, Dan, I just, you know, it's really sad for me to see you leave this position because I have a tremendous amount of respect for you. Uh, and and many, many of you know that I'm, you know, outspoken and, and I have ideas. And, uh, but Dan, uh, I have such tremendous respect. Uh, you were very important to me and to the state associations. And uh, I wish you the best. Jim Bollinger, Eastern Pennsylvania Soccer Association. Uh, three items. First of all, Dan, I'd like to say thank you on behalf of the Eastern Pennsylvania Soccer Association family and membership for all your years of service and dedication. Um, I was pleased to see you actually had a worse hairdo than I did at that age in my life. Although obviously we flipped the coin with regards to your hairdo versus mine now. Secondly, I'd like to say uh, thank you for all your years of service and dedication. And I am happy to see Richard Groff, one of the favorite sons of Eastern Pennsylvania and Region 1, as well as USASA, being inducted as a life member. And last but not least, I want to piggyback what Dave Bort said. I don't think it was our finest moment when we opted to take the easy way out and refer the at-large bylaw amendment back to committee, hopefully not to be buried. So ladies, in that regard, so that doesn't happen, if you want to resubmit this, Eastern Pennsylvania will be more than happy to submit it on your behalf. Thank you. Kendra Halterman from Utah. Um, I also help in the WPSL. 
Um, for all of you that were unaware, uh, Jerry Zanelli passed away, uh, the founder of the WPSL, in November. Um, Jerry was a huge advocate of the women's game, and he will be greatly missed. Um, the WPSL um, has been taken over by three new owners. Um, they are revamping the league and making it stronger than ever, and I encourage all of you to continue to support women's soccer. New York. Uh, good afternoon. Uh, Peter Pinari from Eastern New York, and I'm going to make this short and sweet. Um, on behalf of the, one of the oldest states that is part of this organization, that started this organization, Eastern New York, uh, I want to say thank you to two legends, and I mean that sincerely, uh, that is Dan Flynn and Richard Groff. So thank you, thank you very much. Terry Fisher from Washington. In 1973 and 1974, UCLA, where I was coaching, where Ziggy Schmidt was a player, we lost the final in 73 and the semifinal in 74 to Dan Flynn and St. Louis University. We also, we also this year lost Ziggy Schmidt, and I want to take a minute to acknowledge Ziggy as a personality, as a player, as a passionate soccer person, and uh, it sort of crosses both hairs. We lost a great coach, MLS was nice enough to name their Coach of the Year Award after Ziggy, and I just wanted to acknowledge that connection. Thanks, Terry. There's one more comment. Jim McCarthy, Missouri Youth Soccer, to Carlos and Dan. Carlos, good luck in trying to find a replacement for Dan. <laughs> Dan, uh, you made the offer. Missouri Youth Soccer accepts your offer. You are now part of that board. And uh, I'll end it, Dan, with Go Mix. Well, thank you. Thank you very much, everyone, for those comments. I, th I think today, oh, I'm sorry, the board. Down that end, sorry, John. Yeah, I would like to thank Carlos, Jay, Brian, Dan, and of course UEFA for giving US adult soccer an opportunity to play at a newer level. Uh, we're looking forward to partnering with UEFA in this new uh, cup we will be playing in 2020. Uh, I would also like to ask our CONCACAF president, Victor, to maybe expand this and, and bring something into the region, so give opportunities to amateur teams in, in the region to compete against each other. And while we look for new opportunities, I don't want anyone to forget that our women also play soccer, so let's keep them in mind when we look for opportunities. Thank you. John. Thank you. Do I got to hold it out? Yes. Okay. Thank you, Carlos. Uh, let me start by, uh, by thanking Victor for uh, coming here to our Congress and also, Victor, for your pride and commitment to making our region one of the great regions for the sport. Uh, the time that we spend together and traveling around the, the global uh, soccer football market, it gives me great pride and admiration for your leadership to try to bring the respect to uh, our region of the world. So thanks for coming. I'd like to also uh, congratulate Cindy for her new uh, role and Greg for your new role. And I think it's important to sort of point out that as our sport continues to develop uh, and evolve, and as Bob mentioned, uh, the largest group of pro council members here representing the Women's League, Major League Soccer, the USL. Uh, the vast majority of all those people here are people that came out of the grassroots, played as kids, likely played in college, and then had professional careers uh, like Cindy and Greg and are now working full time in the sport. So part of creating a soccer nation is being able to have uh, opportunities for people to work in the game. And our collective leagues are employing thousands and thousands and thousands of people that now can come out of being a player to now taking this sport they love and be able to make a career in that sport. Uh, so I want to thank everybody who's come from the Pro Council for uh, their commitment to the game. And I want to thank the entire membership for your support of the professionals. 
Uh, and Dan, uh, I want to take a couple of minutes if I can, and I promise I won't take too long to uh, give uh, my respect, my admiration, and uh, support for everything that you've done to lead this federation for so many years. Uh, you have such an incredible uh, commitment to trying to be as good as you possibly can be and bringing out the best in everyone, whether it's your staff or it's all those people that you've worked with. Uh, I have been in this job for 20 years and 19 of those years, uh, you've been there to help me uh, be the leader that I can be and I would not be the person I am and leader of this league if not for you. Major League Soccer would not be the league that it is if not for you. And that time that we've spent together, both having uh, laughs and having our time to try to figure out what we need to do to make uh, the sport better, is time that I will cherish uh, for the rest of my life. I am so happy for you and Kathy and your daughters and your grandkids that they're gonna have more and more uh, of your time. You know, I do believe that people are at their best when things can't get any worse. And having been so close to Dan to see what he went through with his uh, health challenge, uh, all the respect that we have for you, Dan, as a great leader, uh, really is trumped by the fact that what an incredible courage, courageous approach you've had to being in the position that you are today after managing through that. So with love and respect, Dan, uh, we really do appreciate everything. Anyone else? So, to touch on the two people that uh, we've talked a lot about today, and there's some direct links between them and some of the things that both of them said. Um, Richard, who many of you know and some of you don't, is actually a big part of the reason that we've got a commercial program. And starting in the late 80s when Werner Fricker, who we've talked about, uh, introduced him to me and said, this guy's going to help us raise some money, sell tickets and all of those things. And so there is a direct line from that to what Dan talked about in making the sport relevant and having a brand today. And there's a direct line to the fact that we have more or less $150 million in the bank to what, in many ways, Richard started and, frankly, to the way Dan has managed the organization, not just for those 19 years, but as Hank's deputy for several years at the foundation and running an extraordinarily successful World Cup venue in Chicago. And when I think about the great friendship with Richard or the accomplishments that Dan has had over that period of time, I think about his, some of his words today and they are at the other end of the spectrum from a conversation he and I had a few years ago. Um, we were in the middle of a very, very important issue uh, that Jay is familiar with, Dan is familiar with, uh, and I was part of. And it was on a Friday or Saturday we met in Chicago trying to resolve this issue and we got somewhere with it. On Monday, um, I couldn't reach Dan. And at least in my 12 years and since, it is always possible to reach Dan on his mobile and a back number that I'm happy to give the rest of you now for a few months <laughs> when you can't get through on the main number. Um, but I couldn't reach Dan. And Jay didn't know where he was. Brian didn't know where he was. And his assistant didn't know where he was. And his assistant finally called me and said, well, he left an hour ago. And I said, OK. And then that one end of the spectrum, the only time in Dan, who has been an absolute rock in the organization, that I've ever heard a little bit of a quiver, and he was calling me from the airport with his wife and said, I'm going to get on a flight and I'm going to have a heart transplant. Okay. Um, this had come up in that previous discussion, which wasn't the centerpiece of the discussion, but it was several years away when there was a good fit and a transplant opportunity and so on eventually. So have this happen 48 hours later while we were in the middle of this was the only time I've ever heard any fear, not hesitation, we all have that, but any fear. For the other 25 to 30 years that I've known Dan, there's been none of that. The organization is where it is in so many ways, in so many places, financially, on the field, organizationally, in the world, and done it very quietly, as several people have mentioned, without looking for accolades. And then I go to the other end of that spectrum today, and Dan's words, which were uh, extraordinary uh, in so many ways. And some of you have heard one end of Dan's temper uh, along the way. 
And today you heard absolutely the other end of it, which he doesn't share very often, but had a chance to today. And the thing that most impressed me about it was not the humor, which was terrific, of course, but there was no fear in any of it. And leaving a position after such a long time and having a career in the sport, and he's going to continue that sport, it's clear to me, and in some conversations we've had today and now that he's had with all of you, that there's a lot more looking forward to what he's going to be able to do and continue with his family and not any fear about what he's going to miss, and he'll miss part of it. So, Dan, certainly from the bottom of my heart and on behalf of the sport and everyone that adores you and loves you, thank you for everything you've done. No fear going forward, and I'm sure we're all going to remain friends for a very long time. Thank you. Anyone else aside? Chris. Thanks, Carlos. Uh, Dan, I'm not always great off the cuff, so uh, I hope that this comes off as genuine as I mean it from the athlete perspective. You know, as, as athletes, you in the organization as a whole, they put the utmost faith in us that we would perform on the field and win or lose, the support was always there. And it has to work in conjunction with the business. And we look at the organization today and we talk, we always talk about the numbers and the budget and we're positioned better than we've ever been. And that's all because of you, Dan. So while you put your faith in us on the field, we had our faith in you in, in leading the mission and the organization and we're eternally grateful for that. So thank you. Okay, if there's nobody else, let me just say thank you again. <clears throat> I think today has been a great reminder that over the past year we've made some progress, but we still have a lot to do. As members, as councils, as a board, as a federation, in all this work, I just want to reaffirm the promise I made to you last year on behalf of myself and now on behalf of this board. That we are one federation. We are partners, we will listen, we will be inclusive. We will continue to work with all of you in every way we can to deliver the change and the progress we want. That's been, from my perspective, the spirit of our work together over the past year, our meetings today. I know it will be in the spirit of our, your meetings this afternoon. For those who've had meetings, our dinner tonight, I hope everyone will be there. And of course, the year ahead. So thank you to everyone. A special thank you to our dedicated staff at Soccer House for all your hard work, the, the, the amount of uh, detail that goes into organizing these events is, is uh, beyond imaginable. But thank you very much for the great success for this year's AGM. I'm pleased to announce that next year our AGM will be held on the 13th through the 16th of February in Nashville, Tennessee. And as we adjourn and we look to the year ahead, especially the Women's World Cup. We have one message to the world. Here we come. Uh. Yeah. Yeah. Set me free and give me death, there ain't no other choices When I lay down and go to sleep, I keep on hearing voices Little whispers in my head, man, is you fake or loyal? Why no water, that the sign of baby, pick your poison When they hear the sound of the drum They'll be saying, oh Lord, here they come Yeah, here we come Huh, here we come <laughs> Here we come Here we come and when you hear the sound of the drum, we'll be saying, here we come. Yeah, here we come.